relationship of space with uh, with the small talk is one of these um, stateful uh, um, programming environments in which there's no artificial separation between the development tool and the programming languages we actually both are integrated so with uh, with a space we continue that tradition uh, gravity is is a runtime that uh, allows a space to to this programming environment to not only be located in one computer but actually be uh, located in a network of, of computing it doesn't it doesn't come on itself out of nowhere it's actually following a lineage and the, 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 the strongest influence um, on space design as a programming language and uh, development environment is JavaScript. And JavaScript's strongest uh, influence is obviously self and small talk. So basically it's, it is this, it has continued this history, this, this is derivative information of this um, partially lost lineage. Capabilities um, precede object capabilities as these ways of reasoning about authority. And uh, Mark Miller basically created a computational model uh, based on capabilities and uh, the object, where the reference to a particular object is the capability, where access also encodes authority. The, the discussions with him, what, what really like impressed me was first of all his like he, how how activist he, he he is and like the public key cryptography how he told his how how it relates to his personal history and kind of for that that it was really for them about technology uh, uh, freedom and privacy as a technological fact so this is one question why when they are successful well they, they were not great marketers, for one. Uh, basically, when Steve Jobs came, he saw the Alto. Uh, Alto was uh, a much more sophisticated computer than the Apple, the, the Mac. So what Steve Jobs did is utilize those ideas and then they make it cheap to produce because the Alto was really expensive to produce and it was like low production, production but it already had, it had networking, it had user interfaces, it had graphical document editing, it had um, these persistent live programming languages. It, it, it was so ahead of its time in so many different ways. It never got to market. It became like this research project. They didn't have the right form. They didn't have the right organizational form. They didn't have the right economic operationalization. Of, yeah. of making that happen. There's these two extremes with the current and past um, organizational and economic vehicles for innovation. One, on one extreme you have Xerox Park and um, these technologies that they were incubating and producing in which they became really good at bringing in a lot of different experts in different domains under the same environment and they were shielded from economic pressures as to become super creative and, and really be innovative but failing at bringing those to market right so they they will provide this isolation this nurturing this sheltering and and uh, but they will fail to put them out to market on the other hand right you have uh, those that realize that there's, there has to be uh, uh, um, some form of pressure, some sort of objective of bringing these things onto market, but in the process, um, removing the, 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 the incubation, the sheltering that is necessary uh, for these forms to mature. So for not to become prematurely exposed or prematurely uh, converted in, into what the market quote unquote demands, right? And then becoming different to what these researchers, the innovator actually, these innovators actually want to create. So these both forms fail at bringing innovation out to the forefront. 
I, I would say that it's just not sustainable. Like open source, op, open source model of, of, of production is, is, is really being good at producing these new uh, forms of value, but always at the expense of those that uh, do it out of the, the love of their own heart. And the way to monetize it has been through sponsoring, through um, geeks becoming experts, but that's, that's um, certainly not ideal for, for uh, the development of these, of these new technologies. So um, they, they, they were, all of these different forms are asking for a new form of production, a new form of quote unquote monetiz monetization to make it sustainable. Um, I think that um, it's important to, to revive a lost uh, evolutionary branch of computing and that is um, of stateful languages. That means languages where there's no artificial separation between state, the database, and computation, the program. So where both are actually part of the same continuum. So small talk, the language of the Xerox Alto producing at Xerox Park uh, was of such tradition. Actually, um, this, this eventually gave uh, 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 rise to other programming languages like self and whether most people know it or not, uh, other languages such as JavaScript. JavaScript is a stateful programming language. And the funny part is it doesn't get leveraged as such. Mm. So even though the, the, the semantics of the language assume a persistent state, even though the virtual machine in JavaScript allows you to program directly from the REPL, that's not how we're currently programming uh, in JavaScript. We just utilize it to debug mm. the programs, not to create them. So there's only one little gap that we, need, we needed to, cr to cross to make JavaScript uh, stateful, and that is to create persistence. That means that when we shut down our machine or close down the browser, we open it again, the program state is in the same place where it was when we left it, before we closed it, before, before we restarted the machine. So that's why um, JavaScript is such a got good substrate for something like gravity and something like space, because it's already semantically complete to implement this, this um, the abstraction of the uh, orthogonal persistence. That's the, 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 the term, the term utilized uh, for this kind of, of language, programming languages. They're called orthogonally persistent programming languages. What that means is the, the, the programmer assumes that the persistence is provided. It doesn't need to worry about programming the database or querying the database, saving the store, the, uh, storing the state or saving the state or opening the state, but just needs to reason about what is at any point of time the state of the program and then just assume that that's going to persist. It's orthogonal because it's not it's, it's, it's provided without any, any form of interaction or visibility from the, from the programmer. The second part that um, this lineage of programming languages or the second opportunity that it gives us is that once we can utilize this repo um, to program within them and assume persistence, we all of a sudden reveal a relationship. And it's a relationship, an ongoing relationship among two agents. There's, it's a protocol among two agents. One is the executive agent, is the computer, and the other one is the expressive agent, the programmer. So when we reveal the relationship that is embedded in that programming paradigm, and we bring the agent into the forefront, then we can ask ourselves, do we really need to have that artificial separation between the executive agent and the programming agent? Or can we reason about a more complete kind of agent that is both executive and expressive? And then the next question to ask, if we know that we have two agents that now can have the same capacities, do we only need two agents? 
or can we have like n agents? When we have this opening, um, and we, when we um, put this insight into operation, then we can bring the agent and express it as part of the programming uh, model, as the language semantics. So it becomes a first class citizen, like the function, or like the object, like the protocol, in which now we're able to describe within a programming language multiple agents at the means by which they interact with each other. So this is the very definition of space. Space as a multi-agent programming language. And it comes with a history, right? It's just the only thing, uh, the, the insight that gave rise to space as a programming, programming language, as a formalization, um, is the realization that the insight that there was this unnecessary uh, um, embedded relationship among um, two agents, the encoding of a very prevalent myth, uh, and that is a master-slave relationship, commander-executive. And it's no surprise because computing came from the military, mm -hmm. right? So what we realize now is if we really want to expand the grammar of our programming languages into something that is not only the hierarchical command and execute structure, we need to dissolve that particular myth and bring the agents as both expressive and, and performative and uh, allow them to interact according to protocol in which on one hand, one gives access to some sort of performativity through a write, through protocol, through the object capability, and at the same time, someone else expresses what is it that is expecting from another agent, through, for instance, the offer. So the offers become protocols, the, the protocols becomes rights, and the rights becomes the means of interaction and coordination among those multiple agents. So I think this was what Jonathan meant with the lost opportunities, lost cooperative opportunities in the, ah, the, in the history, the history yeah. of computing. Yeah, I think we're done. We're done.